Welcome to Shamba Shape Up Uganda. We are traveling all over Uganda to find hardworking farmers. We want to celebrate them while giving them the knowledge they need to make their farms more productive and adapt to climate change. We want to support them to get better yields and increase their income. We will see how farmers can benefit from our experts' advice and turn their farms around into a profitable business while learning from each other in so many ways. Join us on this journey and share in the farmer's experience on the Shamba Shape Up Uganda! Uganda. Hello? Yes. Uh, how many items do you want? Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Oh, Steven, a minute, uh, a minute, hello, a minute. Hello. I will call you later. I have a visitor here. Yes. Are you Stephen Begumsa? Yes, I am. Ah, good. Uh, we are from Shamba Shepa. You are from Shamba Shepa? Yes. But we oh. thought you were a farmer. Oh, okay, I'm a farmer and a trader. Ah, ah, interesting. Okay, please, can you please show us your farm? Okay, let's go. Ah, good. So I told you this is the place. Why were you wondering? Uh, but you see, you're not even no, sure yourself. I said, uh, we are in Chirumba village in Masaka and we're visiting Stephen Begumisa's 89 acre farm. But wait, this is 10 acres. Are we at the right farm? We are in the wrong farm, clearly. What? We are looking for Mr. Asimo Joseph's farm. Hey, my father's farm. Hey. I'm the one managing it. Jesus. Hey. Probe. Uh, ah, ah. You're the one who took us somewhere else. Oh, oh. Apart from his own land and agribusiness, Stephen manages his father, Joseph Asimwe's 89 acre farm. Is there here, here, here. There's, there's, there's a signpost. Sign uh, there is no signpost. Ah. Uh, <sighs> now I think this is the farm. Yes, yeah, the farm. Yes. You see them there. Oh, oh my God. Uh, hello, Sebo. Yes, how are you, Sebo? I'm fine, how are you? Good, good, Sebo. Joseph, who was an accountant, decided to go into farming back in 1987. He started off with just five acres of land, and now he has 89 acres of land, and he's still counting. First of all, I was working as an accountant. By that time, to get a job, it was a very good Make it, let's put the a tie, you know what, if you go to the office, but at the end of the day, you find that you are, you are doing nothing. So when, when we started that farming, we found that the money is there. The money is there. It's a real business. At 76 years, Joseph relies more and more on Stephen. They grow coffee, of course, Joseph's favorite crop. Matoke, Stephen's favorite. They have pasture for their 30 heads of cattle. And 20 acres of maize, which can bring them up to 50 tons in a good season. That is when the maize is not attacked by a dreaded pest, the fall armyworm. Armyworm, it is big, common, and it affects us if you don't uh, try to control area. All the world 20 acres, you can harvest nothing. Last season, our farmers harvested 20 tons of maize from their 20 acres. On a good season, they can get up to 50 tons. But the fall armyworm is laying waste to their maize. However, our expert from the National Agricultural Research Organization, NARO, Dr. Godfrey Seru, has several methods of controlling the pest. These are the symptoms of the fall armyworm. You can saw the leaves are ravaged. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, it is the most important maize pest in Uganda and the other East African countries. Oh. So once it attacks the plant, it eats the leaves yes. and causes damages like this. Terrible, and terrible. That leads to yield losses to the farmer. Forty percent actually it is loss because of armyworm. However, there are certain things we can do to reduce that loss. That is what we want. One. As you prepare the land, mm. make sure you prepare it a bit early and as you plow, you do deep plowing okay. so that you turn over the soil such that if there are any pupae within the oh. soil, they can be brought Barry. to the surface oh. and exposed to the sunlight, oh, the sun. okay. which causes desiccation and it dies. Oh. Sometimes that process also exposes it to birds, oh, which will eat them. Okay. 
Then other things we need to do is to plant early. Once you plant early, the crop will grow mm -hmm. and reach a stage where it can be a bit more resistant. Resistant, yes. Before the pest population builds up. So planting early would be two weeks before the onset of the rain. Now, once you have a high infestation level, uh, it's good to spray. You ask yourself three questions. The mm -hmm. first one, what do I use? We know the chemicals, Amdox, oh, striker, striker, and the rest. Then, how do I spray? spray? And the third is, when do I spray? So the how do I spray, you have to spray at three places. First, into the funnel. It will find the foramenworm, the caterpillar inside, mm. and kill it. But some of the caterpillars move on the leaves. So you have to spray on the leaves as well. Mm. And they lay the eggs under and the leaf. Yes. So you have to turn the nozzle okay. and spray under the leaf to target mm, the eggs. The eggs. Mm. And now, when do I spray? This pest fears heat. And once the sunlight is strong, too strong, mm. it goes into hiding. If you spray at that time, yes. the chemical will not be able mm. to kill or to reach it. Mm. So you have to target it at a stage when it is actively feeding. Yeah. That is in the morning hours up to around 11. Mm. Then after four o'clock when... Yeah, we spray and it is very costly because uh, the pesticide is very, very, very expensive control armyworm. But our expert, Dr. Godfrey, has another trick up his sleeve against the fall armyworm, the push-pull method. In this method, intercropping the maize with the two other crops. First, we have the napier grass. If you don't have napier, you can use bracheria. Then we use the desmodium. Now when planting, we put the napier at the edges. We plant three lines of napier yes. at the edge of the plot. Okay. Then we plant our maize and between the lines put in a line of desmodium. Oh. Why do we use this? We want the napier yes. to pull the foramen worm. But now the desmodium uh, pushes away the moth <laughs> from the field. Okay. So <coughs> the desmodium doesn't favor or doesn't allow the moth yeah. which lays the eggs the to eggs, settle yes. in the field oh. and now the napier provides conducive environment for the moth to lay the eggs oh. and it also has sticky substances on which the eggs get attached and, and once they, they lay yeah. it hinders the movement of the oh. larvae the napier will be permanent and the desmodium will also be permanent oh. but now every yeah. season you can, you can plant the maize oh. So that way you will be able to control the damage by the fall armyworm up to 80%. Not 100%, but it, 80 is good enough. <laughs> now here we have the napier, mm -hmm. and I'm going to show you how we cut okay. this napier. Okay. We count three nodes. nodes. You want to push these two under the ground and leave one, one at the top. Oh. But when cutting, you don't cut like this flat, mm. yeah. but you cut in a slanting manner, Man. such that the water just flows off. off. Oh, yes. And the napier is planted at the edge of the field. Of the field okay. We plant three lines of napier, oh. and those three lines are spaced evenly at 45 centimeters apart, oh, okay. or one and a half feet. Okay, okay. Then in the middle, we shall Put plant the desmodium. desmodium. Yes. But we are not going to apply it direct as it is mm. because that way we waste the seed mm. and it will be too much mm. in a particular area. So we mix it with some manure and this is a lot of seed we put in little. If you have a very big piece of land, you can divide it into one acre fields such that each one acre has the napier at the edges, at the edges. Yeah, and then the desmodium. the desmodium. If you mix 250 grams of desmodium in one kilogram of manure, it would be enough to cover an acre. Uh, do you think this can work for you? Yeah, basically it can work to, uh, because one, it will reduce uh, the cost I've been using to buy the pesticide, yes. the labor, 
of spraying because this one I, I plant once, mm -hmm. then I leave them into the, into the garden. Yeah. Matoke is Stephen's favorite crop and his father's farm has six acres of it. Our expert from Naro, Winfred Nabite Konachagaba, who knows Stephen, came to see how his plantation has been doing. Hey, I know this man. Oh, no, so He's Stephen. Know yes, I am. We met last oh. December. Yes. And although Winfred likes what she sees, the Matoke hasn't been spared from a major disease, the banana bacterial wilt. Yes, Stephen, my friend. Yes. You also have this problem of banana wilt. Yeah, it's a bit common mm. here in my banana plantation. When did you start experiencing it? Uh, since uh, two years back. So how are you managing the disease here? Uh, to me, mm. what I have been doing, I cut what is affected. Mm. Then after cutting it, mm. I chop it. Mm. Then I left it mm. on the bare ground. Mm. Then uh, they dry. Mm. Then after, mm. I usually uh, bring the ash, mm. tobacco. Mm. Then I mix it with some water. Mm. Then I cover. Mm. So that uh, these uh, flies, mm. they don't come, they yes. step on them, then they, they take another disease. Mm. So that is the best method. Once you identify it within a short time, you see the leaves, the leaves have started wilting and mm. yellowing. We recommend from the government that you cut it and that one will reduce on the spread. But otherwise, if you don't do it, you'll find that the whole plantation is finished. How does it spread? This disease, it is spread mainly by us and at times the animals. But the major problem is us. Then another spread is the insects. But if we remove our male plant, mm. the insects are reduced. I myself, how our, I our control the, uh, this wilt. As a farmer, we always advise you that if you use a tool, whether it is a hoe, it's a pang, a pruning saw, you make sure you treat it before you go to the next plant. If you've used the pan, we request you either to use fire to disinfect it. Yes. We can use jig or any other disinfectant. Ah. The major spread is the tools as we prune, as we harvest. Sagi, yes. you've seen how we've been working yes, on controlling the wheels. Yes, I have. Now you see this mail part? It is the additional thing. Are we going to remove it? Yes, we are going to Why remove it. Why we need the mail part? When you look at it, you see the bees which are there. Yes. Those ones are a source of infection. Ah. Once they, remove the, they move from this plant, they go they to go another to plant one. which is not sick, it, they can transmit the, the disease. Once you see the last clusters formed, yes. you remove the male part. We use that stick which is like this, so that you can easily twist it and mm. you remove this male part without getting in touch with the sap. I see. When it comes to Matoke, nothing deters Stephen. He's thinking of expanding from six acres to ten acres because it is good business. We are the main consumer of Matoke. Also, you see in Uganda, the population is increasing and people, they are no longer want to eat uh, posho, cassava. They like to eat uh, Matoke. So, we have seen right now the, the, the demand of Matoke is increasing day and night. Wow. Wow. These horns look dangerous. You're telling me? I am. I'm going in after the break. You are? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck then, after the break. Huh? After the break. Hey, hey. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Bro, get off this thing, we need to work. You're still here. Adi, can you say I'm busy? <laughs> Karis, please come and help me. Yes. Welcome back to Shambash. Shape up Uganda. Wait, move, move, move. Today, we're in Chirumba village in Masaka and we're visiting Joseph Asimwe's farm, which is managed by his son, Stephen. We've introduced a new method to control the fall armyworm that attacks their maize and tackled banana bacterial wilt in their matoke plantation. We're now going to take care of their cattle and their coffee, their main livelihood. Karis, move, 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 move. That's my line, move, move, move. Shamba, shamba, up, Uganda. <laughs> yes. 
Joseph and Stephen have 22 dairy and beef cows that go out grazing every day. They get 30 to 40 liters of milk from six cows. That's not much. So, we brought in our cow expert, Ronald Nwajira from CKL Africa, to inspect them thoroughly and tell us what's wrong with these cows. I saw these cows were emaciated, mm. and this could lead to so many factors, yes. like diseases. Yes which are brought by ticks, yes. like worms. Mm -hmm. So before I go any further, how have you been feeding your cow? <laughs> you tell us how you have been warming your cow. Number three, you tell us how you have been spraying your cow. We have been uh, grazing on the pasture. Then secondly, on spraying, we have been spraying uh, every week. But uh, I think the chemicals are mm. not genuine. <laughs> then you, you may find uh, you spray today and tomorrow, you find the ticks are still there. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the warming, also we have been warming every six months. We have been feeding only on pastures. Mm. And the way we are looking at the cows, when we look at their body score, uh, we also need to do some supplementation. Some blocks to maintain their body structure so that they remain in a normal shape. Mm -hmm. And like those on which are lactating, can also supplement them with minerals. In this case, you can use for miracles, you can use for macrylic super. Now, when you go to the army, you need to have a regular program. For example, if it is a calf, you are supposed to do it every month, up to six months. Then for the old cows, you are supposed to do it every after three months, not the way you have been doing six of six months. Then it is also very important when we are doing that, you need to weigh using a band, then you weigh, you know, exactly live weight in terms of kilograms of your cow. This will help you to give the right dosage. It is better to do one your cows using Nelson. This one has another ingredient which is not there and doesn't have. It has the ingredient which is called cobalt. cobalt. And this cobalt helps the younger calves to grow very well. Diwami is not for the faint heart. Better be careful. But these guys are professionals. Ronald first weighs the cow with the help of a weighing band. Then he divides its weight by two and measures the Diwama Nilsan accordingly. That's done. On to spray. On spraying, I've like said you've been doing ever after week, which is good, but you are not trusting these chemicals. For example, if you use like a carousel grenade, it is in a ratio of one to one. Yeah, when you are, we read on the labels, yes. usually they tell us to use a one to two. two, two. No. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that is out. I think we shall bring the bottle and you uh, yes. see. You shall bring bring it. Because that one you are supposed to mix one to one. So, the ratio for grenade is one milliliter per one liter of water. But, always make sure to put on your protective gear before you spray your cows. You are supposed to start from the behind part. You spray those points, key points around the ear, around the other, eh? yeah. so that all those key points where the tick hide, you make sure that you exhaust them. And you are supposed to know that you are supposed to use five liters on the calves and you are supposed to use between seven to 10 liters on an old cow. If you use less acalacide, it means some of the ticks will not be reached. And those ones now are going to multiply every week, every after month, and these ones are going to develop resistance. We normally encourage you farmers to, when you use one particular acalacide, you are supposed to alternate after three months. Since uh, two years, yes, we have been using the same the same oh. chemical. That is, I think, the challenge also. we have been getting. Getting. Ah, okay. Yeah, eighty percent of them that are number. diseases that are affecting cows mm. are tick-borne diseases. Oh. Therefore, it is very important to manage to take sure that you manage the ticks. Otherwise, your production will always go low. Your heart will not look very well, very well okay. if you don't manage the ticks. A 
Our farmers have 4.6 acres of coffee. Last season they got 4 tons, but they can get up to 5 tons, even 7 tons, if it weren't for one of the biggest threats to the crop, the black coffee twig borer. After inspecting their plantation, our Cafe Africa expert Andrew Magombe came up with a very forceful solution. Hello. Hey. I can see you're enjoying the shade. Yes, the shade is beautiful because it's too hot today. Beautiful, but uh, this tree is not supposed to be in the coffee plantation because it is a host tree to the, the black coffee tree borer, which is one of the serious pests I've seen in this plantation. Oh. You can see the pest hides in the tree, mm. but doesn't affect the tree. But then it comes and affects the coffee, like you can see this coffee. So ideally, you're supposed to cut out this tree. It's not recommended. And now it seems uh, right now I just cut it. After here, oh, it just takes some time. The earlier you do it, the better. Okay. Now what you do, uh, when you cut this tree, mm. you may need to put banana mm. in between the rows to provide a temporal shade to the coffee. As you replace with other recommended trees like the Motuba, the ficus. How do you control this, Andrew? Now the first thing to do is scout your garden and see. Mm. Yes. If you see the signs of the twig borer, like this drying twigs, mm. okay? Know that it is there. Look around and remove the non-recommended trees. trees that host the, the pest. The pest. Mm. For example, this one is the Musambia. Mm. Then the Musizi. The Musizi. Okay. Overkedo is also not good to be in the coffee garden. Okay. When you are planting it, plant it around the home because it is also a host. When controlling the twig borer, one of the ways is you prune off the infected twigs or branches that are drying. Mm. Yes. Cut them off with a secateur, then put them in a bag and carry them away and you burn them outside the field. If you throw them down and leave them in the garden, mm. the twig borer will come out and will spread again very fast. But as you are doing that, each, from each tree you work, disinfect the tools okay. using spirit or jig yes. before you go to the next tree. Yeah, it's good because for us, we have, uh, I have been using uh, hands. To break, to <laughs> just break, breaking. break, break. <laughs> just, so, just imagine. If I were pulling your beards off like this, how do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> so the second aspect is prune your tree. Prune the tree so that it has provision for light to pass through. Mm. This pest requires shade, too much shade. Yeah. Where there's too much shade and the congestion among the tree, mm. those conditions favor the pest. Okay. They have a hiding place and where to, 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 to multiply. Okay. Then the, 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 the garden needs to be kept free from weeds. Mm. But when you have the shady trees, the recommended shady trees like Motuba, yes. try to ensure that the trees are trimmed so that they don't provide too much shade. Once the, trees, the recommended trees are giving too much shade, also they will... the pest will be under there. Okay. Yeah, so, so even if the Motuba is good, yes, it should be managed? The Motuba should be managed so that there is light penetrating through the Motuba. Okay. So that you strike a balance between light <laughs> and shade. Then also, your neighbors, once mm. you are controlling in your, in your garden, try to sensitize your neighbors because this pest, once it flies, it can fly the distance of a football field. Just imagine the size of a football field. Okay? So, if you control in your garden, mm. you need to slowly by slowly also encourage your neighbors around to control. We call it community action. Otherwise it will, Otherwise it will be coming back. So that is that. If you did that, then your yields will increase. Because this pest has the capacity, the potential to cause more than 50% of yield loss if you don't control it. Because you can see, the, the whole bearing twigs mm. are drying out. That is a direct path to yield loss if you don't control that. Stephen isn't one to waste time. He took our expert's advice to heart and after consulting with his father, the Musambia tree was down. These farmers take quick decisions and it all works out to their benefit because that same day, they sold the Musambia wood for two and a half million shillings. In short, they are good businessmen. 
this father and son will continue expanding. Mark my words, and and they'll make a model business out of farming. I guess our work here is done then. Thank you very much for having us, and we wish you all the best in your farming activities. You are welcome. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yes. And uh, also wish you the safe journey. Thank you. Yeah, next time. Bye bye. We'll see thank you, you yeah. soon. <laughs> bye -bye. As for you, we will see you on the next Shamba Shape Up Uganda. Bye. <laughs> Where's the car? Down there. Down? Down the road. The one that is going. The, the one that is going. <laughs> <laughs>